There are companies that simply doesn't deserve your money. And today we're going to talk about 12 of them. Fellow investors, bonjour. This is Mike Yeru, founder of Dividend Stocks Rocks and passionate investor. You're listening to the Dividend Guy blog podcast where I and my co-host Veronique will help you invest with more conviction so you can enjoy your retirement. Dividend Gold Investors, bonjour. You're listening to the Dividend Guy podcast. I hope you are doing well. My voice is breaking a little bit for a sunny day in the middle of summer. I'm not too sure what's going on, but it's been two weeks that I'm having like this kind of like semi-cold problem, kind of weird. But anyways, I'm with with my co-host, Veronique, so I'm going to let her talk about... (laughs) A lot of stocks today, and I'm just going to sit back and drink water. How about about that plan, Vero? Do you like that? Well, the 12 stocks we're going to discuss today are stocks that you hate, not necessarily me, so I can't answer. Damn. (laughs) Imagine that some of those that you would say, but Mike, I have them in my portfolio. Like, what are you talking about? That's going to be crazy. That's going to be crazy. Yeah, but I I doubt it. Honestly, <laughs> I doubt it. But anyway, uh, and Mike, you know, maybe your voice is related to the soccer season starting off. Like, I know that you're a coach. And <laughs> I, you're... Yeah, I never yell enough, I guess, right? Because <laughs> when I go see Caleb, your son, when I, I get out of the car, I know where you're playing by the sound of your voice. <laughs> Like I'm like okay, that it's there, it's there. I hear Mike, it's there. So no, I'm not. I'm not sure it's a good sign, but anyway. <laughs> All right, and I hope you're ready to live with having some enemies today, Mike, because we might make some. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just like just a, a quick reminder. We're like, yes, I dislike those companies, and I do have like a, like reasons for that, but it's not like anything is personal here, right? There's a market mm-hmm. for a reason. Some people want to buy stocks, some others wants to sell them. My point today is more about talking about the the thought process behind the fact mm-hmm. why I dislike a company or not. Mm-hmm. And of course, we're trying to exaggerate a little bit, uh, a few things, because if not, it's not going to be fun, right? Mm-hmm. But I hope that you can take it to the second degree and not just say, oh, okay, Mike just like bashes on all those stocks and mm-hmm. just slow. And, and I do make mistakes as well, so... All right, enough for the disclaimers. <laughs> <laughs> and listeners, like like Mike just mentioned, this episode should also help you build a bear case for your holdings because it's important to know the downsides and the risk of the equities you invest in. So quick reminder before we start, you should not consider the stocks we mentioned today as buy or sell recommendations. Always do your full due diligence. So first, Mike, let's state the main reasons why you hate some stocks. Is it like a shaky business model, a weak dividend triangle, dividend cuts? I mean, what else? <laughs> uh, it's usually a, a a bad combination of what you just said. But most importantly, what I really dislike is when I hear about investor telling me, oh, but I hope they will turn things turn around or mm-hmm. they've been around forever. And 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 I'm just here today to crash that hope with facts because hope is not an investing strategy and i think that is the most important thing that you can get out of this show today Mm -hmm. is if you are not able to line up kind of like a a one two three step plan for the company that you're following to get back on track and if you have like absolutely no ideas how they're gonna make it and you just think that some magical way is gonna happen and then the business is gonna start to grow again or i don't know like sometimes I just feel that there's a disconnect and investors don't see that the market is actually punishing a stock for Mm -hmm. bad financial metrics, for bad performance. Not because like there's some people, evil people like manipulating the market or just saying, oh, like this stock is not good anymore. There are like most of the time, there are like pretty clear reason why a stock right. price is going down. And those are based on those like shaky business model, weak dividend triangle, a dividend cut, and 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 overall like a struggling business. All right. So the first one used to be in your portfolio, Algonquin, AQN. Why do you now hate it? Well, first, because I lost money on it, I got burned <laughs> big time. And I know that a lot of people feel the pain. So I feel you. And we decided to start 
this episode on a stock that I made a mistake on because I wanted to show you that when you make a mistake, the important part is to turn around quickly and also learn from that mistake. Mm -hmm. So the thing I hate right now is a common reflex for most of Algonquin shareholders or other types of businesses is oh, I'm going to wait until it comes back or at least recover a part of my loss. Because as long as I don't sell that stock, I'm not losing money. Well, it's not true. You're losing money. Let's face it. The stock is down more than 50% versus its peak and it's not recovering very fast. But then we're just like hoping that some magical way again is going to bring back. So the reflex of holding onto a stock has too bad impact on your portfolio. The first one is you keep having a bad stock in your portfolio. So it has a mental weight on on your uh, on your mind every time that you open your brokerage account, you you look at your portfolio and you see that big bold red line telling you that you're losing 40, 50, 60% on a bad mm -hmm. stock. This is exactly what happened with Algonquin. Uh, the other thing is since the dividend cut, and I just used like my simple rules. I have like three rules to sell. One of them is if you fail me as a, as an investor. So if you cut your dividend, I'm selling the stock right away. And yes, I took the loss, but I sold and I moved on since I sold it. Like since the dividend cut, the stock price total return is about minus 3%. So if you're holding in the hope that you're going to recover something, it's been more than a year now. It's been a year and a half and mm -hmm. you still haven't made a single dollar out of that trade. While the TSX 60, if you have just bought the index, is up about 10%. So there is an opportunity cost on top of having this weight on your mind that you keep dragging those losers with you. On top of this, you have that opportunity cost that if you had quickly moved, of course, you have would have not fully recovered your money. And I didn't either, but mm -hmm. I'm actually making more money than if I held onto a big loser like this one. Right. Okay, so which utility would make a good replacement for Algonquin? So depending on where you want to go, uh, you could go for something that is similar, like in the renewal uh, renewable energy, such as Brookfield Renewable, for example, or you could go for a safe bet like Fortis. And this is exactly what I did with my my uh, my shares. I sold Algonquin also because at this level, I tried to determine what are the likelihood that Algonquin can come back. And to be able to do this, you have to remember what really happened to Algonquin when everybody loved it. Mm -hmm. And when everybody loved it, it was a growth by acquisition company business model, very aggressive growth, benefiting from low interest rate. And they decided to go with variable interest rate to actually benefit from even lower rates at that time. Mm -hmm. The other thing that they had is they were surfing on the green energy uh, wave where they used to buy utility assets and then converting them into solar um solar panels or wind farms to generate more renewable energy. Today, Algonquin, of course, is not only not buying more utility assets, but they're actually selling. So they went from growth by acquisition to sell assets to strengthen their balance sheet. That's the first thing. The second mm -hmm. thing is they went from benefiting from low interest rate to getting hurt big time with high interest charges. And finally, they're not greening anymore their assets. They're actually going back to a classic regulated energy business model and selling their renewable assets. So when you're thinking, how can they become a darling again on the market? Well, they're exactly right now, they're just focusing on straining their balance sheet and they do everything but what they made great back then. So it's, right. it's a necessary step to kind of like clean the balance sheet, but it's going to take a while. And after that, they will have to show some growth. And if mm -hmm. they have no in, in growth vectors, they may stay a, a loser for a very long time. So that's why I don't see the, the growth vectors here. I don't see the investment thesis that Algonquin in the next two years is going to be a great 
utility business such as Fortis or such as Brookfield Renewable. Um, you can go also with Brookfield Infrastructure if you want to be something a little bit more diversified. So there are like a lot of good replacement inside the utility sector. Mm -hmm. Now, there were a couple of REITs on uh, your list, so I thought to regroup them. Why are Omega Healthcare, OHI, Artis, REIT, AX.UN.TO, and, of course, Ryokan REIT, REI.UN.TO, why are they on your blacklist? Um, the first reason super important is actually lack of dividend growth. So even Ryok, and we're going to start with Ryokan here. Before it cut a dividend after the pandemic, it was already not liked on my list at mm -hmm. ESR. And the reason was they, they still have this very seductive narrative that they're like across Canada, well diversified. It's a pillar of like real estate in, in, in the country, actually. Mm -hmm. They show high occupancy rate. They, they make several great um, um several great projects and they're even diversifying now because shopping malls, not exactly the best place to be, mm -hmm. but yet they failed on increasing their dividend for a while before they cut. And now they're trying to get back on track again, pushing that sexy narrative where they are going into like apartments and other types of properties to diversify their business model. But more than 95%, more than 90% of the revenue are still coming from retail, retail real estate. And at this point, I don't see that much growth. I see a lot of like stories, but nothing about numbers. So that is one of the reasons why I don't like Ryokan. It failed their investors. So that's like one other strike. And they're not necessarily back on track to grow that fast at this point. And, and they're pretty far away from recovering the previous dividend pay, the pre previous dividend level that they had. Now moving on to the other two REITs, well, Omega Healthcare, like pretty much, it's kind of like counterintuitive because you're thinking the population is aging. We're going to need more care for seniors. So all those REITs around senior properties, healthcare, nursing homes, and all of this should thrive, right? Right. And they did well before the pandemic, but after the pandemic, what happened is they saw their operating costs going higher. Of course, on top of that, interest charges didn't help. So that's another strike for them. And they kind of struggled because a lot of people prefer to stay at home now and try to invest in, in where they live instead of going into the, those, those healthcare home. And all of that put more pressure on Omega Healthcare and they have stopped increasing their distribution. So high yield, mature business with not much growth vectors with no dividend growth. That's a lot of red flags pointing <laughs> towards a single direction, which is potentially one day they're going to cut their dividend. So instead of like waiting and, and just saying, oh, I'm going to cash that juicy yield. Well, I might as well just let it go right now while I'm still not losing too much instead of hoping that one day it's going to magically go back into growth mode, which I don't think is going to happen because the next step, once we have all the boomers in like maybe in like 20 years and 30 years, well, when their boomer, the boomers are out, the population like demographic is going to completely change. Right. And we may eventually get into having an oversupply of those retirement homes. And mm -hmm. that's going to be another type of problems. So for all of those reasons, I'm not too sure where I, I could find some growth there. So the only investment thesis that you could have is, I like the juicy yield and that juicy yield, well, it's going to be very hard to be sustainable and at best it's going to stay as is. So every year you're going to suffer from a passive dividend cut because inflation is real and it's going up. So you're like everything that you buy at the grocery store, just think about that. It's increasing every single year. So if your retirement budget is thick uh, on, on companies like Omega Healthcare that doesn't grow their distribution in 10 years from now, I mean, you're gonna get a lot, a lot of problems to 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 live the same retirement lifestyle that you have right now, and mm -hmm. that is definitely an issue. Mm -hmm. Finally, artist reads uh, similar problems. Uh, you look at the dividend triangle. This one is not looking good at all. And I know again, a lot of people will go with with all of those 
theories that it's going to th things turn or to turn things around. But I mean, revenues are going down. The dividend has not increased since ages. They used to pay, they paid a few like special dividend in 2022, 2023. In 2040, forgot. So <laughs> now, I mean, back then you could have like, I, I get the point where you don't get more dividend every year. So that's fine. But you get a special distribution. So then it kind of like compensated a little bit. So that mm -hmm. makes sense. But once that special distribution is gone and you're stuck again with a stagnant dividend and then you see that revenues are not growing, the company is like struggling to find growth once again. Mm -hmm. Well, no surprise, the stock price keeps going down. I mean, it's, it's just mathematical. Your business, like think of that as the goal of investing is to make money. And to make money, you must buy shares of businesses that are going to generate more money in the future. Because right. if they're not, if they're struggling, there's no point of investing in those businesses. And therefore, the most investors are just selling their shares and moving elsewhere. And that creates a pressure on the stock price. And this is how the stock price goes down. And now you may be thinking, oh, I'm going to go against everybody else on the market, <laughs> thinking that Artis is going to be a thriving REIT in the next five years. I mean, okay, but I definitely don't see the investment thesis here. Okay, so Mike, which REITs would you put on your buy list instead of those? Uh, I'm not a big fan of REIT, to be honest. And of course, right now, it is a pretty difficult time for them, mostly because the market does, do, doesn't like them that much. Uh, they are stuck with high interest rates. It's going to be there for a while. So the choice is limited because I want REITs that are able to grow their distribution constantly. So on the Canadian side, you may go for Canadian Tire, so CT REIT. Mm -hmm. uh, the biggest downside there, though, is their exposure to Canadian Tire because it's like 97% of the revenue is coming from Canadian Tire. So right. tenant dependency, hello, here we come. So that could be a problem, but so far... They've been doing well. They are able to increase their their funds from operation per unit and their dividend every single year. So that's one thing that is great about this one. Another one that is quite frustrating to hold, I have in my portfolio, and it's Granite. Uh, Granite, again, similar to CT REIT, has a high dependency on Magna International, but this time we're talking about like 27% of their revenue attached to Magna International. Uh, they show all the great numbers, super high occupancy rate, uh, growing FFO per units, growing their dividend, uh, low payout ratio around like 70%. So everything is great. But because of the overall pessimistic narrative around REITs and the economy, uh, the market doesn't give it any love. So it is sitting at a double digit loss in my portfolio right now. The reason why I'm not selling is I'm not giving value to an investment by its stock performance, but rather looking at their financial metrics. Mm -hmm. So as long as the financial metrics are pointing towards growth and that I see that there's a healthy balance sheet and plenty of room to continue to grow their business on top of growing the distribution, I'm going to hold on to it, but definitely not a winner in my portfolio at this time. Uh, finally, on the US side, we do have Equinix. Uh, Kind of discussed this one a few times already, <laughs> uh, but definitely a, a, a great one, data center read. So a lot more geared towards growth than the classic like retailer or apartment read that you can uh, run into. Um, the other thing that I love about Equinix is they don't only benefit from the cloud business, but also the rise of AI. And they are able to do co-location. So when two major companies are dealing to get like doing business together, they are able to put them in the same data center. So the uh, transfer of information is faster and also more secure. Uh, so it's not without any risk. I mean, there is always a possibility that the big guys on the tech world decide to just build their own data center and get rid of Equinix. So nothing comes for free, but those are at least showing some growth right now and dividend increases year after year. Mm -hmm. And you know what, Mike, I just realized that I'm really proud of what we did here because, <laughs> you know, listeners, we plan our episode topics like uh, ahead, of course, and then we record them. And I just realized that today we, we discussed like 12 stocks that you hate and the reasons why you hate them and all that. And next week 
we'll discuss four techniques to avoid dividend cuts. And the week after, we will discuss like thriving businesses with 12 dividend growers. So, I mean, subscribe to the show now not to miss that. It's it's like it's a third part kind of series, which I... Yeah, we're kind of like turning everything around from yes. like, get rid of those losers, <laughs> avoid the dividend cuts, and hey, there's a solution. How about exactly. investing in thriving businesses? <laughs> yeah, so hit hit pause and subscribe now. Okay, so Mike, um, as far as I can remember, you always hated Altria Group, thicker MO. Its revenues have been on a downtrend since 2021, so it's not going to help change your mind, right? <laughs> I mean, definitely no. And I remember like the first times that I discussed Altria, it was on Seeking Alpha around like 2015, 2016. And I got my fair share of hate back then. Uh, but that was fun. I mean, that's all right. <laughs> uh, and, and that's why I said in the beginning of this uh, of this show, I mean, don't take it personal. I'm not telling you that you're a bad investor or I hate you. I'm just saying that I don't like this business. Mm-hmm. And that's all. And sometimes I'm going to be wrong too. So that's fine too. Um, the thing with Altria is I just don't see the potential growth Going forward, I see a business that is surely mature, surely have a highly addictive product. So it's a cash flow making machine, but it's still slowing down because their only way to grow basically right now is to increase their prices. And at one point, that is not necessarily a very long term growth strategy. They are trying to find other ways to grow, but all their efforts are basically just compensating the loss that they're having with classic tobacco products. So in the end, not moving forward, they're just like delaying the struggle. So they're just struggling for a longer (laughs) period of time. Um, So I get that they're a cash flow making machine, but that's pretty much the only thing that they're doing. And if you don't generate growth over a long period of time, the market is going to finish you. So that's what's happening here with Altria and and other tobacco products related product like British American Tobacco or Philip Morris. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure that you don't like any replacement in this industry. Am I right? (laughs) Uh, I mean, I can I can bring a twist because I'm pretty sure that there's not an episode that I don't mention Kushtart. So I'm going to do it again. (laughs) <laughs> but Kushtart is actually selling a lot of those products. So if you really, really want to get into tobacco cells and, and other like sin-like products, well, convenience stores could be a good opportunity <laughs> to buy because they're also selling other stuff. So they're not directly linked to this. Uh, but yeah, I mean, besides that, not really. I mean, it's it's not a place where I want to uh, to be exposed in my portfolio personally. Mm-hmm. So another company in the consumer staple sector, which I didn't know you hated, is General Mills, G-I-S. I was such a fan of Honey Nuts Cheerios as a kid, so I must admit it hurts a bit. <laughs> what are its red flags, Mike? Well, okay, to be fair, I do eat Cheerios as well, so <laughs> I'm not going to say. And that is something super important as well. Um, a lot of investors, they make this strange link between I like a product, so therefore I like the company, or I dislike a product and therefore I dislike the business. But the thing with with, with General Mills is not, it's not like I don't hate it with a deep passion, but Mm -hmm. what I don't like is this kind of like link where you're thinking, well, this business has been around for more than a hundred years. It's stable. It's selling like all the things that you can find in the grocery store. So I'm going to just add it in my portfolio. It's going to be fine. And then I look at, okay, so five years analyzed growth rate for revenue is 5%. Earnings is 3.45 and dividend 1.95. So we are looking at definitely a mature business. I mean, I'm not going to like, you're not going to learn something out of this. Uh, But I do see a lot of problems with growth perspective going forward. And even more, while they are able to slightly improve their revenue, their earnings are not growing as fast. So it it kind of like tells us maybe they have other problems with margin. And, mm. and of course, cost of raw materials, inflation, it's hitting them. And there's so much you can do by 
resizing that the the, the size of that Cheerios uh, <laughs> cereal box and increasing the price. At one point, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Like sometimes I hate like other types of cereals. I've done that to a point where I can barely make three balls of cereals with mm-hmm. like one box, and I'm like, dude. Like charge me whatever you want, but please put something in the box, you know? So mm-hmm. anyway, so I, I'm, I'm seeing a hard, I'm having a hard time to see the growth perspective here. And while it is like a safe and sound type of investment pick, the thesis is like, the thesis is there, the narrative is sexy, but the growth is just not there anymore. And Mike, I went on dividend stock, stock stock comparison tool to find a better option in the same industry. And I must admit, it was a bit hard. The only ones that looked kind of interesting were Jameson Wellness, which offers very different products. Maybe uh, JM Smoker, uh, SJM, and maybe Premium Brands, P... Okay, I'm, I'm going to have a hard time here. PBH.TO. Yay. Not bad, um, not bad. <laughs> so are they good replacements or is it like an industry to avoid altogether? Uh, it's not necessarily an, an industry to avoid altogether, but right now it is a very tough market for packaged food. Uh, Jameson Wellness is a kind of like an editor industry because they, they sell uh, vitamins and, mm-hmm. and nutrients. And they're also a small cap and they're also in Canada and they're spending a lot of money on growth, but that affects their earnings. So while I do kind of like their business model and I like where they're going, it will take a lot of time and a lot of patience to get there because right now revenues are growing, but not the earnings, which kind of can right. create a problem when you're when you want to invest. Um, in general, the cost of raw materials and the inflation altogether are putting a lot of pressures on those businesses. And the growth is pretty much limited to like bore, buy more brands and, and just integrate mm-hmm. them to have like more shelf space in grocery stores. Uh, my favorite pick would be actually McCormick, um, which is MKC trading on the US market because they're selling like spices and and I love to talk about the different types of salts when it comes <laughs> to sector diversification. That's true. <laughs> uh, but but this one, this one is kind of interesting because revenues are on the uptrend. Um, earnings right now are in a tough place uh, since 2021. So it's slightly declining and the dividend keeps on growing. So not not a perfect match, uh, but for the price it is right now, trading around like seventy dollars, slightly under seventy bucks. Uh, for a, like the like, what I like about spices is it's going to continue to be a repetitive bus- businesses, and a lot of consumers they are looking for ways to make their food tastes different or better. So like the, and the easy cheap trick to do that is to not necessarily to learn new recipes, but just to add a little bit more flavor, which McCormick is like a leader in mm-hmm. the uh, in the industry. So again, not super exciting, but I would prefer to go with McCormick as opposed to General Mills, for example. Okay, so before we continue, Mike, I'd like to invite listeners to download their free copy of the TSR stock checklist. This is pretty much a cheat sheet that replicates what we look at when we use our uh, stock comparison tool, right? Um, yeah, it's it's a trick to actually take out the emotion from your process and stop like just thinking about, oh, they're going to turn things around or they're a great company. Now we're getting back with like questions written on, on, that, on that checklist that forces you to look at numbers to answer those questions. And, and by simply answering them, which is gonna, not going to take you too, mu- too, too long to do that, it's going to help you a lot have a better perspective of what this business is really is and how the numbers are backing or destroying your investment thesis altogether. So one more tool to get rid of hope. Mm-hmm. And it's an easy replacement as opposed to the stock comparison tool. Of course, the stock comparison tool at DSR offers a lot more metrics and right. like more flexibility. Uh, but yeah, I mean, for as a starter point, if you want to review any of your stock and you want to make sure that they should be part of your portfolio, because there are so many great companies out there, why would you settle for okay businesses? Mm-hmm. I don't I don't think, yeah, I think you deserve more. I think your your money deserves more. And, and if you want to achieve your financial plans, therefore you need to invest in great businesses. And that 
checklist will help you doing this. So you can download the, the stock checklist at thedividendguyblog.com slash checklist. Pretty simple. Now, Mullen Group, MTL.to, is an industrial business in the trucking industry. So it seems interesting at first glance. Why is it not one that you like? Well, the th the problem with Mullen Group is there are better alternatives, and mm -hmm. and this one actually cut their dividend back then, and and a lot of people are thinking, yeah, well, I'm going to invest in a trucking business because anytime that the the, the economy goes up, those type of businesses are making a lot of money because mm -hmm. of, I mean, consumers are spending more, therefore there is more need for transportation, and hey, trucking businesses are there. But those are highly cyclical businesses. So those are the type of business that could look good on prom night. So whenever everybody's spending, they're going to be on top of the on the food chain showing like high single to double digit growth. The problem is it's not happening forever. And therefore, when there's a recession or an economic slowdown that happens, this is a type of business that if they do not have a solid balance sheet and, and generate a lot of cash flow, they will eventually have to cut their dividends. So I rather pick companies that are in a much, much better shape. So I bet that TFI International would be a good replacement. Uh, that's an easy one, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. uh, of course. And and the thing is, TFI International has grown by a lot of acquisition, more than 80 acquisitions since 2015. Mm -hmm. And now they have that, like, laid out playbook that works all the time. They are able to integrate those and create synergies. And what is great is that they have evolved into such a big size that they benefit from economies of scale. So whenever there's an economic slowdown, it's actually working in their favor because their competitors are struggling. Uh, they're, they're struggling. And then therefore they are able to make great offers and buy more competitors, integrate them generate even more economies of scale and, and benefit from that network effect. So they're just like in that great flywheel, but still it's going to be a volatile ride. So do not expect something that's going to be super stable here mm -hmm. when if you invest in TFI, but at least this one is growing towards the right direction year after year. Okay, so in healthcare, CVS Health is among the largest drugstore companies. It has also made some acquisitions in the recent years. Despite all that, it remains one that you hate. Why is it so? Um, yeah, because it's another case where it has a very sexy narrative. They decided to do a vertical integration and start all at the beginning with providing insurance services, managing them, and then bringing those clients into their drugstore. So that mm -hmm. kind of makes sense. When you think about that, you're just like, wow, you're like a one-stop shop. You control every le levels. You get in, in, in relationship with your customers a lot more so you can bind them to your brand. Um, and, and they made a major acquisition. And after that, they had to stop increasing their dividend for like five years. And by the time that they were finally getting better, they did another type of acquisition like this. <laughs> and now they kept on increasing the dividend. I'm not too sure it's going to last for a long while. And and we're just kind of like repeating this business model over and over again. We do have the great story behind it. But when you look at the numbers, the company is not gener necessarily generating like a huge earnings per share growth. And because of that, I'm just saying, I'm just thinking they may have to pay way too much and maybe there's not that much synergy mm. by being vertically integrated in this space. But definitely the company is not able to show a strong dividend triangle for like a decade now. So therefore, I, I kind of like lost a lot of interest back then when they stopped increasing their dividend. They're doing the trick once more. I it, It's just <laughs> enough for me to never look at it anymore in my life. <laughs> okay, so which stock would you pick instead? Um, in the healthcare industry, I would probably go with United Healthcare, especially this year, because they um they were hit by a cyber attack, and I mean it cost them a lot of money. There are lawsuits right now, so this is kind of like a great moment to go in a business that is 
one of the largest company in the healthcare sector in the US. And they're a one-stop shop that is actually working. They mm -hmm. show amazing growth for revenue, earnings, and dividend. Now that the earnings are taking a big dive due to the cyber attack and the lawsuit. But moving forward, once they go past this unfortunate event, I'm pretty sure that they're going to continue to thrive because that was like one big roadblock in, in, in their path. But once it's settled, they're going to just continue to do what they have been doing for so many years. And one thing that I really like about United Healthcare is they have been able to adapt in a highly regulated, changing environment um, in the U.S. And they're always they always find ways to make it worth it and, and mm -hmm. to generate growth going forward. So because of their expertise and their track record, I would be tempted to say that that is just a roadblock that is going to be passed on. And after that, we're just going to talk about more growth going forward. Okay, moving on to the material sector, a company we previously discussed on the show, but that still makes you grind transcontinental tcl.a.to explain the reasons for your hard feelings what i hate about this one is too many investors get those type of businesses for the yield they're just mm -hmm. thinking oh transcontinental i mean it's like a, a, a great business because it pays a, a very high yield and that's great it used to grow their dividend because their business model was pretty cool back then They were in the printing media business. So, of course, today, that part is heavily dying quickly. <laughs> um, and, and then what they did is they, and but they were smart. They tried to um, find other ways to grow. And, and this is always something that you have to remember. Uh, unfortunately, the economy changes, consumer taste changes, business changes. And eventually, what used to be amazing 5, 20 years ago, is probably struggling today and so on. So mm -hmm. Transcontinental, um, they bought a packaging business a few years ago, made the integration, trying to compensate for the fact that they were losing while they were like being affected by a major slowdown in the printing media. But it's not fast enough. The integration is more complicated than expected. And it's not exactly going towards the, the way they, they wanted They suspended their dividend growth policy. So now they're stuck with the same dividend. And again, high yield, struggling business, no dividend growth. Well, you can imagine what's going to come up next. I mean, it's pretty much like <laughs> you get into too many debts and your mortgage payment is killing your budget and, and you're not getting any raise at, at work. Well, at one point you'll have to cut somewhere. Maybe you're going to cut on your vacation. Maybe you're going to cut on your children allocation, but you have, you will have to cut somewhere unless mm -hmm. you lose your house. So it will come down to that point where management will have to say, well, now we have to get more cash flow out of the business. And one easy way is to cut the dividend. So a lot of investors will say, yeah, but it's prudent that they don't in increase their dividend right now. And I totally agree. The problem is why in the world they got there in the first place. So if they had managed the business in a different way and kept on thriving, they would have been able to keep the dividend growth going. The fact that they have stopped is more a consequence of bad management and the inability to adapt to a new environment rather than prudent management. Mm -hmm. And what would you replace it with? Um, I would go with something a little bit similar in terms of like the packaging aspect, and it will be CCL Industries. Uh, mm. CCL Industries, it's in my portfolio, a long-term dividend growers for decades, well-diversified business serving several different industries, se serving several uh, different geographic uh, segments as well and mostly providing packaging labels rfid um, services to um to to their uh, to their their customers um i like the diversification and they grow also by acquisition as well so they've been able to constantly grow their revenue earnings and dividend for many 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 years as opposed to transcontinental <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I kept some of your favorite hated stocks for the end, Mike. <laughs> But we'll start a little smoother with Western Union, WU, 
Why is this financial on your blacklist? All right. So my axe is ready now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sharpen, ready to roll. Uh, Western Union, I don't even get why this business is still operating, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, I look like, okay, bear with me with a second. I look at the dividend triangle. What I see is at almost every year, revenues are going down. Almost every year, earnings are going down. And guess what? Shocker. Starting in 2021, the dividend is the same. Kind of like, like who would have told that? Like, who would have believed that a business not able to increase their sales, not able to increase their profit, would have to stop increasing their dividend? Mm -hmm. Kind of crazy. And the result of that is the stock price is just going down and down and down and slowly dying. And I'm not too sure, like, What's the utility of Western Union? I mean, yes, they are doing specific things that maybe will be a little bit hard to replace, but is it enough to be a complete business by itself and mm. definitely not enough to drive like by what we see right now? So something that rhymes with Visa or MasterCard would be better, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, if you're thinking about like payment transfer, I would go for two companies that have a duopoly that doesn't seem to be attacked by anything because they have such a strong moat. And we have discussed those actually in our Modi business mm -hmm. uh, episode back then. And, and one of the reason is this, I mean, every single time that you pay with your card, they're getting a percentage of that transaction. And because you absolutely want to pay with your card as a consumer, you do have a huge power over merchant that like merchants, let's be honest, they don't want to pay MasterCard or, or, mm -hmm. or Visa any fees, but they're pretty stuck with that. Even right. Amazon tried to ban Visa purchases in the UK. I think that lasted like less than a week. Mm -hmm. uh, they, I mean, it was probably more like a, a negotiation power move, which kind of makes sense to like kind of like force a little bit more Visa to get back on the table and negotiate better rates. Mm -hmm. But in the end... I mean, I'm sure that Visa told Amazon, like, dude, everybody wants to buy stuff with our, our card, so you'll have to keep accepting it, and we can negotiate the fees, but we're not going to get rid of them anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. Hey, dividend growth investors, this is Vero. Mike is currently taking a sip of water, which gives us 10 seconds, and I literally mean 10 seconds to grow the podcast together. Go on Spotify or Apple Podcast, hit pause, and then... Under our logo, you'll see two very interesting buttons. One to subscribe, hit that subscribe button now. And then give us a five-star rating. You know, our goal is to help more investors just like you. So please spread the love. Thank you. Still in the financial sector and to end this episode on a good note, let's discuss Laurentian Bank, LB.TO, and a new one next to it, Scotiabank, BNS.TO. Why do you have such bad feelings about them? Uh, Laurentian Bank, not, I mean, a, a, a usual, uh, in, like a usual guest on that kind of list, right? <laughs> um, the thing is, these days, investors have hoped that it's going to be bought up by like another bank or something, and then they're going to see some of the stock price recover. Similar to what just happened with Canadian Western Bank in June when National Bank announced that they wanted to acquire it. So long-term shareholders of, of CWB saw their stock price going back up a little bit more. So they will kind of like recover or make a little bit of money depending on when they bought. Uh, the thing with Laurentian Bank is completely different because they have nothing to offer. And, and just to prove my point, I mean, it's not just my opinion. They were on sale in 23. They said, hey, like, let's put like the, the for sale sign and try mm -hmm. to get a, attract a buyer. And, and crickets. Nobody. <laughs> like, I mean, <laughs> if like that could be my opinion, but now you have the fact that all the other banks are just like, dude, I'm not going to buy this. Like, there's no <laughs> point. And the reason why there's no point. So like, instead of like, just feel like sound, I don't want to sound arrogant or anything. So we're going to go back to the business model here. Mm -hmm. So Laurentian Bank is a small bank, have to compete with all the big five. But on top of that, they are in Quebec on National Bank and Caisse des Jardins turf. So you already have like two major super regional financial institutions there. 
plus the big five that are trying to grab market shares in Quebec, and you're like the smallest player over there, limited business segments that could generate a lot of money. So you're pretty much stuck with the classic savings and loans, but with less capacity. And the other banks are not interested in buying you out because what they think is they can literally open a branch right in front of yours. Exactly. Just mm -hmm. attract clients like this. And mm -hmm. they, they don't even have to pay a penny for this. And because of all of those reasons and the fact that Laurentian Bank lack of vision they and and they literally have i i i i worked in the banking industry for so long and they kept changing their vision and their long-term plan every like four years because every single time they tried something it failed and mm -hmm. my guess is one of the reasons why it happened is not only just bad management it's just because they went on a high roller poker table with like a hundred bucks in their pocket while everybody has like more than a million dollar. So it's <laughs> really, really hard to make something out of this. And it's unfortunately, this is pretty much what's happening with Laurentian Bank. So it just, yes, yeah, so I didn't want to make fun of that, but literally from a, 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 a rational perspective, the dividend triangle is super weak. It's the only bank that cut their dividend um, following uh, the crisis of 2020. And they just, do not have the resources to compete against the others. Mm -hmm. Now, Scotiabank, and I did a quick episode on Moose on the Loose about like two, two, three months ago. Um, and I said that Scotiabank failed their shareholders because they said this year they're not going to increase their dividend. So already all the other big six, they increased their dividend by like five, six, seven percent a year. Uh, it's been two years in a row where Scotiabank increased it by only 3%. And now this year, they just said, not going to happen. Again, mm -hmm. prudent management. Yeah, I commend that because they show the highest payout ratio among the big six. So it is smart not to increase the dividend, but it's also a big warning signal that Scotiabank is not performing as good as the others. And, and right. we have discussed that a few times before, but... The banking business model have greatly evolved over the past 10, 15 years since like the financial crisis of 2008. And each bank decided to take a different strategy, a different route. Um, some with more success than others. Scotiabank decided to go on the international market. That brought a lot of volatility in their, uh, in their financial reports. But it was not a tool to outperform others. And right now, they're a little bit struggling because of that. It was a sound strategy, kind of liked it at first and, and mm -hmm. sound good, but unfortunately didn't work out. And this is why right now they are struggling and they're kind of like left out of like the best performing banks because of those reasons. Okay. So let me guess your replacement for these ones, National Bank uh, <laughs> or maybe any other Canadian banks at this point, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I would go for any others, but, uh, of course, National Bank and Royal Bank are my favorite. Mm -hmm. uh, and the main reason why I like those two is their diversification. Only 50% of their, their, their revenue is coming from savings and loans, while they can also count on capital markets, wealth management, insurance, or expanding outside of Canada. So this is mm -hmm. the reasons why I prefer those two. And of course, when you look at the dividend, dividend triangle, they show better metrics on revenue earnings and dividend growth over the past five and 10 years. National Bank has been the most generous dividend grower with the lowest payout ratio of among all of the big six. Royal Bank is not too far behind as number two. As for the other banks right now, there are like some opportunities slash risk that are a little bit mm. higher. So for BMO, um, they had some bad quarters, a lot of provision for credit losses. It's difficult in the US, um, but they're known to report hectic quarters from one time in a, uh, like from time to time. They take a little bit more risk for also. So sometimes they will come up with like great numbers, especially from capital markets. Some other times, not so much. So right now we are in that phase where we're not sure if it's the beginning of the problems that are starting or it was just a bad quarter and now they're going to move on with something better. You'll have to wait and see, but still a little bit harder to put your money on this one as opposed to National Bank and Royal Bank. As for TD, 
Um, it's it has been like my third favorite one for a long time, but the investigation about anti money laundering um, in the U.S. is a big concern. It's a big mm-hmm. concern because best scenario they get slapped by a fine, which would be perfect considering what what just happened. So they will have to write a huge check, but they can survive this. Worst case scenario, they're they are capped and they cannot grow their business in the US for the next five or 10 years. That happened in the past and that was a major shocker. So then if it ever happens, TD is going to lag for a while before it gets back on track. So it's going to test investors' patience big time. But still, at this point, high risk, high reward type of play because if they just get slapped with a fine, it's going to be a very bad year, but they, then they can move on and keep on with their growth in the US. Mm-hmm. And they've been doing very, very well before that. So that could be interesting to have a look and follow that story. And finally, CIBC, I'm, I'm more like in a meh type mm-hmm. of like mood when I look right. at it. Uh, a little bit of lack of strategy on this one too. They're trying to do a little bit of everything, which sometimes works, sometimes not that much. Uh, and because of that, they're also showing weaker numbers than the other banks. So they're a little bit better than Scotiabank, but besides that, they're definitely worse than all the others. So, and I'm talking about like five to the past five and past 10 years. This year, they're actually doing better than TD and BMO for like recent problems that they're facing. So again, I'm, I'm more like neutral, not really enthusiastic on this one. All right. So thank you, Mike, for making your bear cases so clear. Listeners, it's important to know why you like or why you hate a stock. Having a bear case for your holdings can help you monitor the risks. To make sure your stocks meet your criteria, download the stock checklist for free now at thedividendguyblog.com slash checklist. We also mention quite a few like related content, so visit thedividendguyblog.com slash 185 for the show notes and all those links. Next week, we'll discuss how to avoid dividend cuts. Subscribe not to miss it and leave us a five-star rating. Until then, stay Stay invested. invested. Hey, fellow investors, it's Mike here. I hope that you have enjoyed this episode. Please note that the Dividend Guy blog podcast is at no time issuing buy or sell recommendation. Please do your own due diligence as this podcast is recorded for information and hopefully fun purposes only. Uh, Make your research, make sure you do your stuff. We're not responsible for your losses or your profit after listening this episode. And until next one, stay invested.